<clears throat> well, hi, friends. It's good to be back with you at your lovely congregation. The last time I was here at one of your services, I'd stopped on my way back from a board meeting at the mountain. Uh, I have to admit that the opportunity to have lunch with Holly uh, prominently figured in that calculation. <laughs> I'm proud to say that I serve on the UUA's Commission on Appraisal with Holly. I'm also a member of the Religious Educators Credentialing Committee, so you might find a, a hint of that in, in my speaking later on. Um, oh, shucks, I forgot my... Uh, I was going to hold up a book. <laughs> so Holly was good enough to write a very nice blurb for our book. This is the book, and if you turn it over, there's the blurb on the back. Um, <clears throat> so uh, she wanted to be sure and offer you the opportunity to buy uh, a couple of books for yourselves and your friends um, after the service. Uh, we even have a BOGO, so, but back to work. Uh, so we'll start off with a simple definition of humanism. For me, it starts off with our first principle, the inherent worth and dignity of all persons. And I would say the inherent worth and dignity of all beings, but that's really a discussion for another time. Another one of the uh, foundations, uh, in my estimation, is our seventh principle, the interconnected web of which we are a part. And that's another important part of the definition. And then finally, um, humanists believe that direct observation and rational analysis is the surest way to know the world. Humanists believe in the laws of nature as opposed to some supernatural laws, or as you might think of them as unnatural laws. The words we use matter. Now let me soften that a little bit. Arthur C. Clarke reminds us that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And Niels Bohr, the um, Dutch physicist who often would comment on these vast calculations that his colleagues would make and then draw conclusions from them, he would say, no, no, you're not thinking, you're just being logical. Um, so this mode of being separates the softer religious humanism from the harder monotheistic religion of secular humanism. We sometimes need to be reminded that our knowledge and our intellect are finite. So our working concept of humanism is humans are inherently good and worthy. We humans, like the rest of the world, are all connected and that direct observation and rational, ana rational analysis is the surest way to know the world. So let's set the stage a little bit. Working together, we humans have come to dominate the world. We vanquished our strongest bipedal competition some 40,000 years ago when our Cro-Magnon ancestors drove the Neanderthals to extinction. That may seem curious because the Neanderthals were bigger and stronger than our ancestors. However, like us, our ancestors were much better at working in concert to achieve a goal. In this case, Cro-Magnon used their ability to work together to annihilate the more solitary Neanderthals. And we've continued down that path of working in concert and that's been one of our distinctive competencies ever since. And we have become very, very good at working in concert. We're big, we're bad, and we're very strong. But we need to be reminded by the Taoists that our greatest strength is also our greatest weakness. And this is so, so true today. Earth's epochs are time periods that mark significant changes in the Earth. Epochs used to be defined by evidence in rock layers and typically lasted more than 3 million years. We're not yet 12,000 years into the current epoch, but many argue that we've already entered a new one. 
that is not based on rock layers, but rather reflects the unprecedented changes to our planet in the roughly 200 years since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> Many who study such things say that we're now in the Anthropocene. This geologic time period is anthropogenic. That means it's human influenced. This is based on the overwhelming global evidence that atmospheric, geologic, hydrologic, biospheric, and other Earth systems are now altered by human activity. Our ability to work effectively together have brought changes to Earth's systems, which imperils our biosphere and threatens the very survival of our species and many other species too. Working together, we can save our little piece of the web. We can we work to re-knit it so that rather than being a hole where we once were, we can have, be part of a strong, vibrant web. So let's talk a little bit more about humanism. In leadership training, we like to talk about, uh, tell a story of the, two, uh, the uh, old fish who greets a couple of younger fish saying, gee, isn't the water nice today? And when he swims on by, then the, the two younger fish turn to each other and say, what water? <laughs> so let's look at the rise of humanism so we can better appreciate the water we find ourselves swimming in today. Humanism had its beginnings and the most profound effects during the Renaissance. The Renaissance marks the point where we move from the Middle Ages, the time of the feudal era, to modernity. Feudalism was the dominant social system in medieval Europe. So under feudalism, the nobility held lands from the crown in exchange for military service. Vassals were in turn tenants of the nobles, and the peasants or the serfs were obligated to live on their lord's land, give him homage, labor, and a share of the produce in exchange for military protection. And as you can see, the feudal system was very autocratic. The crown's word was not to be questioned by the nobles. The nobles' word was not to be questioned by the vassals. And being at the bottom of the pecking order, peasants and vassals had no authority at all. And the assumption was they had no thoughts worthy of attention. The really striking thing, I would think the really difficult thing, was that your station in life was strictly based on the station of, in life of your parents, and there was absolutely no chance for advancement beyond your current station. So it was all luck of birth. Renaissance comes from the word, the French word, rebirth. And it started with an intense interest in learning about classical philosophy philosophy. Renaissance thinkers considered the Middle Ages to have been a period of cultural decline. And we can recall that the Middle Ages were also referred to as the Dark Ages. Renaissance thinkers sought to revitalize their culture through emphasizing texts and philosophies of the ancient Romans and Greeks from a time known as the Classical Age. Renaissance thinkers expanded and interpreted these ancient texts, creating their own styles of art, philosophy, and scientific inquiry. Some major developments of the Renaissance include astronomy, humanist philosophy, the printing press, painting and sculpture techniques, world exploration, and in the late Renaissance, Shakespeare's works. Probably, uh, my, in my estimation, the most important aspect of this new body of thought was that the individual was placed at the center of things. And that focus led to an emphasis on the direct experience and reason that we've talked about, rather than authority and making decisions, which in turn led to the development of science. 
For example, the crown and the church declared that the sun, the stars, and other planets revolved around the earth. We're the most important place. We live here. <laughs> and the earth was the center of the universe. People were actually put to death for suggesting otherwise. Thankfully, in the end, direct observation and science went out, but at a terrible price. Renaissance humanism focused on a worldlier human outlook, focusing on the ability of humans to act and not, not blindly follow a religious plan. Renaissance humanists believe God had given humanity options and potential and that we humans must act to make the most of this. The emphasis also meant that individuals should have some say in the important things in their life. These new insights resulted in the Protestant Reformation that produced the many branches of Protestantism. And I'd never really thought about it before until I read it, but thus, from the beginning, all Protestant denominations grew directly or indirectly out of humanism. The Renaissance marked the time when authority moved from the station one held in life to the individual's direct observation and reason. Rather than authority being invested wholly in maintaining the status quo, it became invested in coming to know the world better. Let's shift now for a moment from the Renaissance humanism to look at how it has manifested itself today and its relevance to Unitarian Universalism. We can start by looking a little more closely at religion. Not all religions re embrace Renaissance humanism, a prime example being the Roman Catholic Church in which all ultimate authority is invested in the Pope. But we need not let that authoritarian form of religion be our definition of religion. So a little more on that. The word religion comes from the Latin religar, to bind. It's also the root of the word ligament, the connective tissue between our muscles and our bones, which enables us to complete physical tasks. Religion. Religion is about connection. The connection be, can be of the authoritarian style, which diminishes the role of the individual, or the more modern humanist approach that holds up the importance of the, of the individual. Either way, either way, religion is about how we connect with each other. We connect so we can do things we can't do by ourselves. That includes building Android telephones and Tesla automobiles. Perhaps more important than building things, connection enables us to become more mature, caring, and educated individuals. The common thread that runs through James Fowler's stages of development, Jean Piaget's stages of cognitive development, Lawrence Kohlberg's stages of moral development and Lev Vygotsky's social development theory or zone of proximal development is the developing individual's connection with other people. You know, if you come from a dysfunctional community, it's much harder for you to progress. If you come from a nice nurturing and uh, well-functioning community, then you have a much greater opportunity to become a little bit more than what you are. And that was the hint that I'm also on the RE credentialing committee because we talk <laughs> about all those guys a lot. <laughs> so the 1997 Commission on Appraisal Report, Independence, Renewing Congregational Polity, actually says it quite well. Being part of a religious community is a personal commitment that reflects a theological vision, namely, a sense of interdependence or covenant, our nature of existence. Being in community then is not incidental to being a Unitarian Universalist, but in its intrinsic and inescapable. The religious community 
is the vital matrix of the formation of the members' diverse personal ministries. In turn, its members reshape the community. So, Unitarian Universalism is, at its base, I believe, a humanist religion, and it's reflected in our seven principles. I mentioned the first and the seventh when developing our basic definition of humanism, but I'm really interested in how you all feel about the other principles and how they might be reflected in humanism. So, uh, and if you care to comment on the first or the seventh also, I, I would welcome that. But uh, the first being the inherent worth and dignity of every person, and the second being justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. You want me to turn the mic? Yeah, would you mind? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Don't be shy, it's okay. Certainly the, uh, um, democracy. Hmm, mm hmm. Would you say a little bit more about that? Just that this requires that we each have our own responsibility mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. members of the larger body. Yeah, to be in informed and to. It have the ability to make choices that uh, uh, we feel is, are the best, and we each as individuals. It's not, you know, who gives the most money or who comes the most often or does the most bake sales. It's uh, each individual has their uh, their say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, I love the concept of the inherent worth and dignity of all beings. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. very important. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's hard for me to see how we can fully embrace the seventh principle, you know, the interconnected web, without uh, giving that same dignity to, to other beings. And, you know, to me, it really extends beyond the personal. I think that some of our forebears and, and the, the humanist thought about bringing it down to the individual really feel like that pendulum has swung too far, that we need to be... I often like to say that I'm a communitarian Unitarian Universalist because I... <laughs> not because the name is too short, but uh, because I think it's the community that's one of the really important aspects. Um, I think also... Yeah, Hold her like a rock star. Um, the, there the, you go, yeah. The free and responsible search for truth and meaning really fits well, too, since this is a, in scientific, you know, understanding things logically and all of that. Excellent. Thank mm -hmm. you. I'm just curious on your thoughts. You, you mentioned uh, on this, re Renaissance thought was... Uh, Self-actualization, observation, scientific method, medieval thought was maintaining the status quo and the power of mm -hmm. the few. Aren't we fighting that battle still? It would seem, yeah. And more so today, perhaps, than, than in the past. <laughs> I made a note. Uh, this may not be what you want us to talk about, but I made a note. Uh, when you said knowledge and intellect are finite, how do we know? Hmm. Um, how do we know that knowledge and intellect are finite? It's a good question. Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, one of the clues for me would be the fact that we have a, a wide diversity in intellect. And so if we have people who are a little bit short in that suit and people who are longer in that suit, that we can assume that there continues to be a greater and greater uh, capacity for understanding. You said finite. You didn't say infinite. You said finite. Did you mean but, infinite? No, I meant finite because, 
Sure, yeah, no problem, thank you. Um, because it's finite today. That doesn't mean that we can't continue to progress, but that our knowledge and certainly our intellect is, is, uh, is limited. We don't, uh, we're not omniscient or... Thank you. We don't know everything yet. Yeah, hopefully not. Yeah, that'd be so boring. <laughs> uh, hi, uh, I'm Carol Ward, and I'm an English teacher, so I just was interested in what you said about Shakespeare. Is he the ultimate limit in what we can do? Has anyone ever really written anything better than Shakespeare? I think I would defer to the English teacher. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I appreciate your attention and your thoughtful comments.